贵椒。ông dù nội dung các bản to các nhóm đại ca để tiếp thị sản nạc ca năng đào biển ca chuyên từ nội sản biển nhá năm bảy bản to cả về sản địa sản than bật chọc đào bạc luôn Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'll use my last five minutes before I turn the floor over to my colleague uh, to address um, uh, just a couple of issues that were, were raised by our friend uh, Sonoru in his arguments about the new jail. We heard uh, an argument that there are only, only 25 confessions with annotations indicating they were sent to Noon Chea. And that this represents a small percentage of the total number of S21 confessions. Your, your Honours, I simply remind you here that when the defence referred to a total of over 4,000 confessions, that number represents unannotated original confessions that were recovered at S21. There was a relatively small number of confessions that were located outside S21 uh, that contained annotations. So these statistical analysis that the defense uh, have relied on here is a distortion. The truth is that Noon Chea received many confessions from S21. I will not play the video clip again. You've heard it a number of times now. I'll simply remind you of Noon Chea's own words when he was asked by Tet, Tet Sambat about his receipt and use of confessions. He said, in Noon Chea's words, Quote, I didn't read all the documents because there were so many. Your Honours, uh, you should also keep in mind the reason why this evidence is relevant to your judgment in this case. The defense is correct that for purposes of this judgment, you need not decide whether Noon Chea assumed complete responsibility for S21. The relevant issue that is before you is simply whether Noon Chea participated in or contributed to the CPK plan to smash enemies of the party. And in that respect, Your Honours, whether he received one S21 confession, 25 confessions, or 200 confessions, that evidence proves his knowledge of S21, it proves his involvement in the JCE through which enemies were identified and killed. And last, Your Honours, the uh, defense uh, suggested that there is nothing in Nunche's interviews with Tet Sambat in which he acknowledged his responsibility for S21. I would simply refer you to Chapter 7 of that book, a, a chapter titled Enemies, which is full of statements attributed to Noon Chea proving his involvement in S21, his relationship with Deutsch, and his knowledge of and agreement with extrajudicial killings of enemies. Let me give you one example and show you on the screen. Sonarun challenged us he said, if Noon Chea had admitted this to Tet Sambat, wouldn't Tet Sambat have said so in his book? Here's what Tet Sambat said. Quote, Noon Chea doesn't apologize for S21, even though his niece, niece and others close to him were sent there. He often stated that the enemies responsible for killing people in the countryside had to be smashed. Um, Others were aspiring to overthrow Pol uh, Pot and had to be stopped. But for every person uh, they killed, they found out through the traitor's confessions obtained at S21 that there were more enemies. The arms and legs of the traitors were everywhere. And continuing, for the first half of the Khmer Rouge uh, rule, uh, Noon Chea uh, didn't have direct control over S21, but as one of the top leaders uh, of the movement, 
He was involved in decisions to purge the cadre. And when Khmer Rouge Defense Minister Son Sen was dispatched to the border in the fall of 1977, Noon Chea became the de facto head of the interrogation center, according to Brother Number Two and testimony Your Honours, I simply ask you to look at all the evidence together. We've been through the evidence many times in this trial, the evidence of Noon Chea's involvement. It is our submission that it is clear beyond a reasonable doubt that Noon Chea was at the very heart of the CBK criminal plan to smash persons who were identified as enemies of the party. I thank you for your time today, and I will pass the floor to my colleague to talk to you about Q-Sampan. I thank you for your time today, and I will pass the floor to my colleague to talk to you about Q-Sampan. Good afternoon, Your Honours. Good afternoon, Council, members of the public. As my colleague just indicated, I will be addressing you on the evidence pertaining to the criminal responsibility of Q. Sampa, as well as his role in the CPK and DK. I will. Note briefly before I start, a one procedural issue that arises for consideration. My friend has just made submissions in relation to the scope of the trial, which of course, as your honours have indicated on numerous occasions, includes the roles of the accused in the entire regime, as well as the policies of the regime. If I can add to my colleague's submissions, there are two further reasons why evidence relating to the functioning of the regime and its policies is directly relevant to this case. My learned friend, Mr. Verkin, took us in some detail through a list of paragraphs relevant to this trial. One section that he may have omitted was that dealing with paragraphs in which allegations of the widespread and systematic attack are set out. Those paragraphs are paragraphs 1350 to 1372. They speak for themselves. Uh, they set out clearly that the relevance in this trial, in this trial is a widespread and systematic attack against the population of Cambodia, the regime's policies, as well as the roles of the accused in the regime. There is nothing unusual about evidence of a widespread and systematic attack going well beyond issues pertaining to the responsibility of an accused. This, in fact, is a common feature of cases involving crimes against humanity, and I will refer by name only to a few cases where this is clearly set out. A recent judgment, or relatively recent, of the ICTY in the case of Lukic, 20th of July 2009, at paragraphs 890 to 894, deals with contextual elements of widespread and systematic attack, and it makes details finding, detailed findings on matters going well beyond the specific crime with which the accused is charged. Blagojevich, equally an ICTY trial chamber judgment, paragraph 551, ICTY, Dakumbitsi, an appeals chamber judgment in July 2006 at paragraph 102. And what one could go on, certainly it is a common feature of these cases that contextual elements have to be proved and that they go beyond, well beyond, the specific events with which the accused are charged. There is a further reason why it is relevant for your honours to consider evidence of the contributions of the accused to the regime and to what we have called the slave state that they set up. By the very definition, 
Forced transfers are continuing in crisis. You heard from our learned friends, counsel for Mr. Kusan that there were a series of justifications or purported justifications for the forced evacuation of Phnom Penh, as well as subsequent forced transfers. Under international law, in order to establish that a transfer is lawful, the defense must show that as soon as the reasons for the transfer cease to exist, that the population is permitted to return. Therefore, it stands to reason that the actions of a regime, the actions of the accused in furthering and managing that regime and preventing evacuees from returning to their homes are directly relevant to the crime of forced transfer. Relevant authorities on that issue are Stuckage, Appeals Chamber of the ICTY at paragraph 284, Kerstich, Trial Chamber, ICTY at paragraph 524, and Preishnik, Appeals Chamber of the ICTY at paragraph 725. I'll move on now from issues of procedure and scope to deal with Kusam Han's criminal responsibility and his role in this vast joint criminal enterprise. We've heard quite a few what I would describe as far-fetched submissions over the last few days from the defence, and in particular from my learned friends from Kusan Khan. But perhaps the most far-fetched of all was the submission that not only was Q Sam Han not, not a leader, not only was he not involved in the crimes or the joint criminal enterprise, but he didn't even qualify to be a person in the leadership of the party. And why did he not qualify? Because he was an intellectual. My colleague Nick Kunjian has already referred to this point and illustrated its complete lack of a logical basis. But if I can take that one step further, was Q Sam Pan the only intellectual in the leadership of the CPK? No. Who were the other highly educated leaders? Son Sen, Ying Seri, Nguyen Chia, Khoi Thun, and the list goes on. Several leaders of the standing and central committees, highly educated individuals. Kisan Khan, in that sense, is not unique. What were his contributions to the establishment and furtherance of the joint criminal enterprise in the pre-75 period? Well, we know that he has admitted that he made an indispensable contribution to the very creation of the fund and run, the coalition which fought the war against the Khmer Republic. An extremely important political coalition which enabled the Khmer Rouge to recruit thousands upon thousands of young Cambodians to fight for, to fight for the CPK and die in their cause. Q Sam Pan was the highest-ranking communist in the fund and government. He admitted in his OCIJ statement, E3-27, that he was indeed the only one, the only one who could have established that coalition with the prince. In his submission, my learned friend Verkham posed the question, when was it that Q Sam Khan accepted the use of violence if he did, as we allege? Well, Q Sam Khan has himself provided an answer to that question. In a video which we have played a number of times in this trial, a video entitled Facing Genocide, Q Sam Khan and Paul document E3 slash 4201 at 16 minutes 35 seconds and onward, Q Sam Pan explains that he joined the Khmer Rouge because they, share, they shared the same goals. 
But according to the Khmer Rouge, those goals could only be obtained through violence. And then he goes on to pose a question and answer it. When did I accept the use of violence to change the society? Answer, it was when USA used long to occupy our country. He accepted the use of violence by his own admission in 1970, and he proceeded to further, to lead, and to encourage an enterprise which was, we allege, at its core, criminal, because it involved executions of innocent people, it involved enslavement, it involved, involved forced transfers well before the Khmer Rouge took control of Phnom Penh. Evidence of Q Sam Pan's support for that violence? E3-116, a statement he issued in September 1970, three years almost before the fall of Phnom Penh. He calls on the population of the city to eliminate the main traders, including Lonol, Serik Matak, etc. And others and their subordinates. There you have it. 1972, Q Sampan calling for elimination of civilians and their subordinates. January 1973, a statement we've referred to a number of times in this trial, E3-637, Q Sampan celebrates in clear terms the destruction of ten strategic villages. Are we to believe that people that lived in those villages were exclusively Khmer Republic soldiers with whom the CPK were engaged in an armed conflict? Of course not. In the same statement, he celebrates the smashing the smashing of 10,245 enemy heads. In his testimony, witness Mea Swan, who fought on one of the battlefields which Q San Pan discussed in that statement, confirmed the accuracy of the information, thereby showing that Q San Pan was in receipt of reports from the battlefield and that he used that information to issue public calls for violence, to issue public calls and encouragement, as well as endorsement, for killings. When the city of Wudong fell in March 1974, he said in E3-167, on 18 March, our People's National Liberation Armed Forces liberated another city, Wudong, by annihilating all the public soldiers there, along with their reinforcements, in other words, over 5,000 enemies were eliminated, 1,500 of whom were captured. This event happened in 1974. You have evidence before you that in that period, the Khmer Rouge, without exception, executed captured soldiers. And of course, that is what happened at Wudong. Kusam Khan uses his high office the highest office held by any communist in the Funk and Grunk coalition to endorse these killings. I will now move on to deal with the participation of Kusan Khan in the first forced transfer or the evacuation, forced evacuation of Phnom Penh. And I will respond to some of my learned French submissions, but I will also refer the court to our written brief, which deals with the evidence against Kusampan in detail. My learned friend, he say, argued that the evidence in relation to the meeting at B5, which Kusampan attended with Nguyen Chia, is not very credible. 
strongly disagree. This evidence comes from a witness who in our submission was consistent, who showed clear memory, and who was found not only by us, but also by Philip Short as highly credible. Of course, I'm discussing people. What is some of the evidence he gave? Or rather, let me address it this way. What are the submissions by the defence on the weaknesses in his evidence with respect to the meeting at E5? They say, well, the meeting didn't discuss any details. There were no details discussed at the meeting, and therefore, even if Khi San Pan was present, even if he was there, and even if he agreed to the evacuation, well, it wasn't significant because they didn't discuss any implementation. He appoints evidence on the 26th of July 2012 and 31st of July 2012. 2012 discusses the details, a blackboard, a definition of spearheads by Pol Pot in the presence of Nguyen Chia and Khi San Pan, the issuance of instructions to various divisions as to which spearhead they were to attack. Each zone and division were given specific instructions. The very definition of the planning of an unlawful act. The next submission they made was that it is implausible, as people suggest, that there were so many commanders present, because why would they have everybody in the same place? Wouldn't that have exposed them to danger? Well, unfortunately for my learned friends, their own client has admitted otherwise. In E3-27, his OCIJ statement, he confirms he was at Pol Pot's headquarters West of Udong. He confirms he was, in his words, briefed by Pol Pot once in a while. And he confirms that other commanders, or rather commanders who commanded the battle to overthrow Phnom Penh, were also there. Tamok, Khoi Thun, Kepok, Son Sen, and Sao Pim from time to time. Interestingly, our friends, Council for Nguyen Chia, make the same concession in paragraph 417 of their brief, confirming that the meeting at B5 indeed discussed the liberation, as they call it, and subsequent evacuation of Phnom Penh, and that it was attended by these commanders. Is that the only evidence of Q San Pan's contribution to the forced evacuation of Phnom Penh? Of course not. The defence were at great pains to attack and impeach the evidence of witness Nu Mao. What was Nu Mao's evidence? This man, a commune-level cadre, attended meetings in 1974 at which he learned of certain disagreements within the party leadership as to the plan to evacuate. He described for you in detail how Tamok said that every zone would be evacuated and indeed threatened people who disagreed. He also discussed another session taught by Hu Yun who opposed the evacuations. That evidence comes from a statement he gave Ben Kiernan on the 26th of August 1981, not long after the events. And the confirmation of the authenticity of that document is given in D269-4, a correspondence from Ben Kiernan. What is Nu Mao's evidence? He confirmed in his testimony on the 19th of June of this year that he knew at that time that Q San Pan was in favour of evacuating the people and that Hu Yun did not agree. He confirmed that twice when questioned by us. Asked where it was that he learnt that information, he gave a specific location, consistent with his 1981 statement. Under cross-examination, our learned friends went to great length to try and confuse Nu Mao. 
đâm bay bầm phun đủ máu. Who, as was obvious to everyone, is an elderly man. Nè, đang hay thà coi chim nuôi chim. Was quite frail and struggling to keep up with the proceedings. They insisted on using the word position. What was the position of Hu Sanpan against his evidence, where he had struggled to, or where he had confirmed that he did not know Hu Sanpan's position? At on the twenty. On the 20th of June, at 14, 10:52, he is asked the question as to whether or not he knew Q Sampan's position on the evacuation. His response: No, I did not know his position. Full stop. A couple of lines below. As for Mr. Q Sampan and Mr. Hunim, I did not know them. No mention of the word evacuation. In our submission, clearly Mr. Numao was discussing his knowledge or lack thereof of the positions of Q Sampan and Hunin. Is that the only evidence of Q Sampan's support for the evacuation? No, there is more. Pipun, on the 26th of July 2012, not in relation to B5, but in relation to political indoctrination sessions in the months following the fall of Udong, Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia and Khu Sam Khan teaching their subordinates as to the good experiences from Udong and how those experiences will be implemented once Phnom Penh is taken. The evidence of Nu Mao and of Phi Pun is of course consistent with other accounts. The defense's favorite witness, Francois Ponchot, testified on the 9th of April 2013 that the practice of evacuating the cities was so broad that everybody knew that this is what the Khmer Rouge did. And he said at 1344 people were evacuated. Heads of groups were killed. This thing is not new. That happened already since 1973. In her submissions, Madame Chia Liang referred your honours to two witnesses interviewed by Steve Hedder in E3-1714, both of whom confirm a pre-existing policy to evacuate cities, and one of whom specifically said if we had captured Phnom Penh in 1974, we would have also evacuated it then. To all of this evidence, what does Q Sampan say? In his interview with OCIJ in E3-210, he says that he didn't know. He had no idea that there was a plan to evacuate Phnom Penh. In our respectful submission, a clearly disingenuous and dishonest statement, a statement that Q Sampan has elected not to have tested before your honours. It is therefore not entitled to private value. But he said another thing in that interview. He said, I clearly realized that the population might have fallen along the way. In his own words, he realized that people were going to fall. In other words, people were going to die. When did that happen? In his version of the events, on the 17th of April, when he overheard a conversation between soldiers, what did he do in response to that information, in response to a realization that people would fall and die? We've referred to this statement a number of times, but I will summarize it again. E3-118, Q Sampan's first opportunity to address the people of Cambodia, to address the millions who had been evacuated and dispossessed. And these are his words, quote, this is our nation's and people's greatest victory. And he celebrates how they smashed all enemy maneuvers, how they relentlessly attacked, how they drained the enemy 
of all his strength, including food and rice. And how finally, quote, the enemy died in agony. Those are the words of Hugh San Pan on the 22nd of April, 1975. He was in Phnom Penh. He saw an empty city. He saw a ghost city emptied of the millions of its inhabitants. His response, our nations and people's greatest historic victory. But there is even more evidence of Kusan Khan's intent to participate and actual participation in the decision to evacuate. Malone and friend, he say, referred to an interview given in 1982. This is E3-687, a New York Times interview, 9th of July 1982, in which Q. Sampan admits unequivocally and without reservation that the evacuation of the cities was a collective decision, a decision in which he, in which he participated. Does he deny giving that interview? No. Does he deny saying those words? No. What do they say to explain this clear admission? Well, he was a politician. And he was making a political statement. And it was important to show loyalty. Do not be misled by this statement, Your Honours. This is an admission, and as such, it should be treated. Is that all? No. E1529 is a recent interview, a video interview, where he affirms that had a single voice been raised against the evacuation, there would have been no evacuation. Entirely consistent with his 1982 admission that this was indeed a collective unanimous decision. My colleague Rainer referred also to a justification he gave recently, which is remarkably consistent to the justifications given by Hopwat and Nguyen Nguyen and very different from that which you have been hearing from his lawyers in this court. If I can move on to Kusan Khan's positions and roles in the Ministry of Commerce, and I will try and move on through this quickly, even though the material is voluminous. Why is it relevant? It is relevant because by supervising this ministry and state warehouses, he was contributing to a joint criminal enterprise. To, to forcibly move people into forced labor camps, to enslave them and to subject them to inhumane conditions of life in order to extract produce, which Q. Sam Khan and his colleagues then withdrew and kept in warehouses in Phnom Penh. You saw in my colleague Bill Smith's submissions evidence of Q. Sam Khan's receipts of vast amounts of produce from, from various zones in E3 slash 3511, including millions of kilograms of rice withdrawn from the northwest zone. Role in commerce. They say, well, he was only a technical assistant. No real role, no real authority. They could not be further from the truth. This man was indeed the party centre's man when it came to running the slave state on a day-to-day -day basis. Within that collective leadership, he was in charge of withdrawing produce from the cooperatives, from the slave camps, and using it as he and his colleagues determined to be appropriate. They say he wasn't in charge, it was Koitum. Because Khoi Thun was appointed in October and then in March 76 to deal with matters of 
comments. what happened to Khoi Thun? He was put under house arrest in April 76. One month after being appointed to the same committee with Q Sam Khan to deal with purchases from China. Where was Khoi Thun kept under house arrest? Your Honours heard evidence from his former messenger, Pan Kian, on the 2nd of May and the 3rd of May 2012, explaining that Khoi Thun was indeed held under house arrest some 300 metres from K1, a location at which Khoi Sam Pan, Pol Pot, and the other leaders worked on a continuous basis. The next set of submissions that I wish to address was the defence's attempt to impeach the evidence of witness Sakim Ulmut. By way of a very quick summary, Sakim Ulmut testified that Q Sam Khan and Vaughan Vett were indeed the upper echelon when it came to the Ministry of Commerce, that they supervised that ministry, that they had power to direct that ministry, that the ministry had no power to do anything without their approval. Of course, they found this quite inconvenient. So in their submissions, they say, well, he was presented with documents. He was forced to say this. He was confused or he was making speculations. Again, false. The documents I showed you, when you gave that evidence, E3 slash 1613 and E3 slash 1614 are minutes of meetings that Sakim himself attended. He was indeed reluctant to go into great detail on his own role during the Khmer Rouge period. But the evidence showed that he was indeed very much connected to the Ministry of Commerce and understood the matters in which he was giving evidence. Before I address that evidence, how did Sakim Ulmut respond when the defence accused him that he was just speculating? 5th of June 2012, in response to my learned friend Kong Samon's questioning, he says, I was not just making an assumption without any basis. I was basing that conclusion or assumption on the documents. And clearly, according to the documents, it is very likely that Han was about the Commerce Committee. That was at 10.10.52 on the 5th of June. Then my learned friend, Kong Samon, asked the same question again, coming from a different angle, at 10.14.29. Sakim Ulmut again confirms, I am not just making assumptions. And who was Sakim Ulmut? Well, he testified before your honours that he was Deputy Director of the Foreign Trade Bank of Cambodia. What was his proximity to Q Sam Pan and the Ministry of Commerce? You have on the case file nine sets of meeting minutes with foreign delegations attended by Sakim Ulmut. This man was intimately familiar with the matters he was discussing. Seven of the meetings he attended were indeed reported to Q Sam Pan. In a further meeting, he was in fact the most senior representative from the Cambodian side. That is in E3 slash 1642. When I asked him about that document on the 4th of June 2012, he did not deny that he attended the meeting and he did not disagree with me that he was the most senior person. He also received ledgers indicating the expenditure of money to purchase items from China. And one such document is at E3 slash 336. It contains annotations referring to both Q Sam Pan and Sakim Ulmut. What did Sakim Ulmut do after 1979? He was a minister in the Democratic Cambodia government presided over by Q Sam Pan. E3 slash 1435. 
a man obviously considered competent enough, senior enough, knowledgeable enough to be Secretary of State for Supply and Transportation in the government of Democratic Cambodia that Khi Sam Han led within months of the fall of Khmer Rouge. Is Saki Mahmoud's evidence out of context? Are the defense right when they say, well, it wasn't Kusan Khan, it was Vaughan Vett, who was really in charge? On the case file, there are more than 20 reports from the Ministry of Commerce to the apparition. How many of those reports are addressed to Vaughan Vett? Zero. How many of those reports were addressed to Q Sampan? All of them. But they say that Q Sampan was not Ankara. When they talk about Ankara in these documents, you should interpret that to mean somebody else, not Q Sampan. Really? In the documents addressed to Q Sampan, in those 20 plus documents, numerous references to Ankara indicating clearly that the Ministry of Commerce was communicating to Q Sampan as a representative of Ankara who would provide further instructions. And you will find that, Your Honours, in E3 2041, a report addressed to Ankara, which states, quote, I apologize, a report addressed to Q Sampan, which states, and I quote, request Ankara to form opinion in order to inform them of this matter. Similarly, E3 2042, E3 and all of these reports, Your Honours, indicate clearly that the Ministry is reporting to their superior, seeking his instructions and asking for his approval or guidance. Two documents particular, of particular interest, E3-1637, a report of the 12th of November 1978 on negotiations with Yugoslavia. Again addressed to him, or rather contains an annotation already sent to Brother Hem. It says, I would like you, brother, to be informed of this report and give your comments as guidance. Or you might say, well, that doesn't prove anything about Ankar. Let's look at another document. E3-1638. E3-1638. States, it refers back to the document I just mentioned, saying the report was made to Ankara. It confirms that the report of the 12th of November, which was submitted to Kusampan, was in the, in the words of the Commerce Committee submitted to Ankara. And who was Ankara? Judge Cartwright asked that question of Professor Chandler on the 18th of July 2012. He testified that that was the collective, the leadership, the group mentioned in the standing committee that he, in committee minutes that he was looking at, including Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, Khi Sam Han, Ying Suri, and other leaders. He confirmed that same conclusion when cross-examined by the defense on the 24th of July. 2012, and he did so on several, in several instances. Or they might say, well, Professor Chandler is merely speculating. Ankar was clearly a reference to Pol Pot, not a reference to the collective leadership. E3-740, an instruction, a directive from Committee A70 on the use of the term Ankar. It criticizes Kadra for using the term to refer to individuals and says, and I quote, the term Ankar or party is used only for the organization. It shall not be used for any individual. So when the Ministry of Commerce addresses Ankar, they are addressing the collective leaders and they are 
addressing them through their immediate superior, Q Sampan. That much is proven beyond any reasonable doubt on the documents before your own eyes. I will not go in great detail on the evidence of Q Sampan's participation in the party centre. It's discussed in detail in our written brief. By way of a summary, he attended 86% of the standing committee minutes meetings for which minister He has admitted that he lived and worked with Nguyen Chia and other leaders, including Pol Pot, that he took part in self-criticism sessions with them, that they did nothing separately, they ate together, they did self-criticism together. He is the third most frequent attendee at standing committee meetings. Only Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia attended more often than Q Sampan. Several full rights members of the standing committee attended less frequently. The implications of that evidence that he was very much in the heart of power, that he was with those leaders in Phnom Penh in charge that they were a collective decision-making body, that they devised their policies and had them implemented together. Other facts of his authority, of his actual executive authority, and his ability to contribute to this regime and this joint criminal enterprise. Evidence of witness may have sworn I will not discuss it in detail. On the 4th of October 2012, you will recall, Your Honours, this witness describing how he, as the newly appointed Secretary of Sector 103, was instructed by Q Sampan to report to him on all matters in the sector, including the circumstances of Q Sampan's wife's relatives. What happened following that telegram? Mayor Swan and his boss the new Secretary of the North Zone investigated the circumstances of Kisampan's relatives. They found one of them to be imprisoned in the Siem Reap prison with 700 prisoners. The Secretary of the new North Zone personally goes to the prison and arranges the release of Kisampan's now, the defence insists that there's some problem with this evidence because the report back to Kyu Sampan may or may not have been received. We say that it's completely beside the point. What the episode demonstrates is that Kyu Sampan, either personally or through his membership of the party centre, was able to direct a zone secretary to investigate the whereabouts of his relatives, and he was able to have his relative released from a prison in which 700 prisoners left. You also heard evidence of a meeting on the 5th and 6th of January 1979, where Q Sampan presided in Phnom Penh. 100 or more people attended, all of them in leadership positions. The subject of the meeting? The Vietnamese invasion. My friend Gise takes issue, or rather says, that the fact that he was discussing enemies, well, that's normal. Enemies are invading. We don't take issue with that. But what enemies was he discussing? Evidence of witness Ruh Soi, their own witness. On the 25th of April 2013, he confirms his prior statement that Chi San Pan said that the problems with the Vietnamese were caused by enemies borrowing from within. A phrase, Your Honours, and this court is well familiar with. A code word for internal enemies. A code word for those to be purged. Another import of that meaning is that he was presiding over a meeting involving at least 100 senior cadres. Again, evidence of his authority, power and influence. They take issue next with 
or alleged inconsistency in her evidence was the year in which Q Sampan taught. Q Sampan said in that session, according to Ek Hen, that Pan, a senior cadre in Officer 70, had been arrested as a traitor collaborating with the Vietnamese. What is clear from her evidence is that she was not confused both the defence for Q Sampan may have been in, her, in the full transcript of her OCRJ interview, D94-8.1, she makes it clear that there were two sessions, one in 76 or 77 and one in 78, and that the second one was taught by Q Sampan. That establishes that the time that Q Sampan gave that presentation was relevant and consistent indeed with him confirming Pang's arrest. We, of course, have evidence confirming Pang's arrest in early 1978. She confirms that in her OCIJ, the full transcript of her interview, she confirmed that in court when cross-examined by my learned friend, Mr. Verkan. And she did so twice. In the transcript of the 3rd of July 2002, on two separate she confirmed that it was Yusam Khan that gave that lesson, that it was in 1978, that it was the second and not the first session, and that the first session had indeed been taught by Mon Chia. Other witnesses who confirmed Yusam Khan's participation by way of encouragement, endorsement of the criminal policies, and more, a civil party whose evidence they also sought to impeach. He talked about how Q Sampan encouraged Kadra to look for those who pretended to be sick, particularly to look for infiltrated enemies to watch new people in particular because they were steeped in feudalism. His evidence was uncertain on only one point, and that is the date of this event. He was at pains on the 28th of August and on the 29th of August to explain or to affirm for the court that he was telling the truth, and he specifically acknowledged, I may not remember the date, but I remember the event. And so his evidence stands. Other witnesses who gave similar evidence to Q Sampan's political indoctrination, Pierpon, Pan Kien, and even witnesses interviewed by Philip Short, one of whom discussed Q Sampan's justification for the evacuation of the cities. Just, just as he had contributed to the forced evacuation of Phnom Penh and the criminal policies that underpin that event, as well as the second forced transfer and the killings of Khmer Republic officials and soldiers. He supported the enemy policy more broadly. Of course, you have heard now numerous occasions uncontradicted evidence that he issued the decision to kill the seven traitors. He sat in a meeting on the 8th of March 1976, E3-232, in which arrests were discussed. He was a member of the Central Committee at a time when the infamous decision on the right to smash enemies was issued. He confirmed to Steve Hedder in 1980 that all of those who were arrested were guilty. In other words, they got what they deserved. In his speeches in 1976, 77 and 78, Using the highest offices in the land, he endorsed CPK's policy to search for and eliminate its enemies. That evidence is on the case file, and I don't propose to rehearse it. He also played his part in denying democratic Kampuchea atrocities, another contribution to this criminal plan. In his interview in August 1975, found in E3-119, he discussed the criticism of the democratic Cambodia regime as propaganda designed to discredit and slander 
This propaganda was nothing but an irritating and meaningless noise. And he did this on many occasions. An apologist and a defender of the CPK and its criminal policies. He did so after the period as well, as you well know, from his 1987 book, E3-703, in which, while acknowledging mass arrests, he said, we killed less people than died in car accidents. In other countries. All of this evidence your honours, shows a continuing, unreserved, active, and committed participation by this accused in the joint criminal enterprise, which led to the crimes with which he is now charged. He was a member of the centre. He was one of the most trusted people working closely with Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia. You must not believe his assertions that he did not know, that he did not participate. The evidence exposes them as nothing but their lies. And if I can say a few words in conclusion, Your Honours, on behalf of the Office of the Co-Prosecutors, at the end of what has been a long and complex trial, I wish to go back to the 17th of April 1975. This was a day which could have been a day of reconciliation. It could have been a day of hope. It could have marked the end of the suffering of the Cambodian people. The Khmer Rouge prevailed in the war. Their adversary surrendered. General May Sechan in his broadcast on the 17th of April, invited them into the cities and said, the doors are open to you, calling them his blood brothers, seeking to reach out in a spirit of reconciliation, committing himself and his troops to maintaining order so that the Khmer Rouge can take power. But in their hearts, Your Honours, there was no room for reconciliation. There was no room for compassion. Any leader who wanted reconciliation on the 17th of April, any leader who was not intent on committing mass crimes, would have permitted people to live in freedom. They would have allowed people to live with their families and in their homes. They would not have dispossessed them. They would not have forced them out of their homes and into an enslavement that was to last for almost four years. Instead of accepting the offer of reconciliation, they set out to destroy an entire way of life and to turn a country into a suffering nation of slaves. The plan, steeped in criminality, based in the use of violence, brutality, Enslavement, murder, all those who resisted. People were out of the city, but that was not the end. There were to write biographies because searches were continued to continue for the end. These accused appointed themselves the masters of every life in this country, they took it upon themselves to decide who lived and who died. They brought this country to its knees. They caused the death of almost a quarter of its population. Let's not forget, Your Honours, that they institutionalized extrajudicial killings from the highest offices in this land and order went delegating authority at every level to smash those inside and outside the ranks and order criminal in every sense of that word. These accused and the organization they led were masters of deception and hence the use of the word ankar, hence the use of the codes 
870. The veil of secrecy and the rules which they employed and But we submit, Your Honours, that that veil has been lifted. It has been lifted by evidence before you. What that evidence shows is that they ran the slave state through a highly organized, central, centralized hierarchy. They issued directives and received reports, as you have seen time and time again. They kept themselves informed of the crimes, and they ensured that the crimes continued to be committed. Hugh Sampan and Nguyen Chia are guilty of the crimes with which they are charged, because they were at the heart of this joint criminal enterprise, because every crime committed was committed in furtherance of the policies they adopted. They are guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and the sentence they deserve is a sentence of life imprisonment. Nothing less can ever match or even come close to matching the gravity of the crimes that they are guilty of. We ask your honours to judge them fairly, and we ask you to find them guilty. And we ask you to sentence them to life imprisonment. Those are our submissions. And unless we can assist your honours further, the prosecution will rest. Thank ໝາຍເລີຍນີ້ດາວເປີນັ້ນຕ້ອງສໍາລະໃຫ້ໃຫ້ມົນນັ້ນສໍາລະឲ្យຈໍາເບດສົມໃຫ້ຈໍາລ
ដូច្នេះយើងខ្ញុំគិតថាវាជាការគួរសំប្រសិនបើមកមកសាមសិបនាទីតំណងទេគឺដូច្នេះយើងខ្ញុំគិតថាវាជាការគួរសំប្រស